time out of your life to learn about health. Uh, I put a quote up here. It says, an educated, healthy, and confident nation is harder to govern. Why would I put that up, and what exactly does that mean? Can't pull the wool over the eyes of healthy people, usually. That's pretty good, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a really pretty decent answer. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm going to just re. I'm going to uh, uh, say this quote in a different way. An educated, healthy, and confident nation is harder to manipulate. Yes. Okay, so my goal tonight, and my goal in this office is number one is to help people get healthy and to educate people so you can make better decisions, <coughs> more informed decisions. And if you need to go to a traditional medical health care provider, you can ask them better questions. You can think deeper about what's going on with what, what he's offering you and about your health. And if I can do that, then I think I've succeeded. Okay? So, I don't know if I can make you more confident, but making you more educated and healthy might make you more confident. So, let's, let's get into the talk on uh, cancer. So let's do a little history. Cancer, it's, it's a modern disease. It hasn't been around forever. The first reports of cancer appeared in the scientific literature in 1761. Uh, people were getting nasal cancer from chewing snuff. You know, and I think that's probably still happening <laughs> somewhat, you know, and, they, and, and chimney sweeps we're getting cancer of the scrotum back in 1775. Wow. Now, I don't know about you, but you know that, yeah. that'd be kind of nasty to have that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the University of Manchester indicates that cancer-causing factors exist only in industrialized societies. Well, back you know, in the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s, what they have? Yeah, that's when they started getting cancer. So, in ancient times, cancer was extremely rare, and we now know it's basically man-made. Um, there's nothing in the natural environment that can cause cancer. So it has to be man-made disease, down to pollution, changes in our diet and lifestyle. Ooh. And that's uh, Professor uh, David at the University of Manchester, England. That's a quote from him in 2010. Uh, Weston A. Price. You ever heard of him? Anybody ever heard of Weston Price? Probably the most famous dentist that ever lived. Um, went, a, went around the world and looked at different cultures uh, to see what, what cultures got sick and what cultures didn't. He found that, that cultures that ate a native diet, the diet that they grew up with, that wasn't processed, it wasn't full of sugar, those people are all, all healthy. And he looked at their, face, their, their, their facial bones and their teeth. They all had normal facial bones, normal teeth. And it was when people went to a modern industrialized diet that they started having to wear braces, that their facial bones changed, that their teeth changed. And uh, he wrote a, a, a very, uh, uh, very famous book about that. And what he said, he says that instead of dying because they contract disease, individuals develop disease because they are dying. Uh, so cancer cells grow in a toxic environment. So blood congestion, lymph blockage, immune system failure, lack of oxygen. Uh, this year... 600,000 people, oh, really over 600,000 people die from cancer. One in two men, one in three women will be diagnosed in their lifetimes. And, I mean, if I ask you, how many of you have had friends or relatives that have died of cancer? Mm -hmm. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody has. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, Hi. come on in. Yeah. Got a seat right there for you okay. if you want it. All right. Thanks. So. We all know people that have had cancer, and I've had relatives that have died of cancer, okay? Um, despite all the announcements and all the drugs and all of that, 
the, cancer, the death rate from cancer is really not, the rate of death is not that much different than it was in the 1950s. In other words, people dying percentage, per percentage of population. It's not that much different. Uh, if we look at cancer, cancer receives more funding from the National Institutes of Health than any other disease. Every major pharmaceutical company is looking at cancer drugs. However, cancer, until recently, was considered a genetic disease. But the, se the success rate to, to target genetic mutations is terrible. Yeah. And I'll tell you why in a minute. More than 700 drugs have been developed, and only one has made any meaningful difference in the lives of cancer patients, and only in a certain type of leukemia. So, I don't know if you ever heard of Eric Topol. He runs a, a website called uh, Medscape. And I used to use, his, it's a pretty good health website, it's pretty traditional, but they've got a lot of good stuff on there. He's a, he's a, a cardiologist. He lives in, he's at University of California at San Diego. And he said, uh, he's the, uh, uh, he said this about chemotherapy. It's just medieval. Yes. He said, it's such a blunt instrument. We're going to look back on it like we look, what we do like in the dark ages. That's from a very, he's a very, very well-known cardiologist. Uh, let's, let's look at, um, the, the genetic theory of cancer and some of the observations. So, genetic mutations in the DNA of cancer vary widely and wildly from individual to individual. So, what does that say about trying to treat a genetic cancer with pharmaceuticals if it's different for everybody? It doesn't work. Yeah, it can't work, okay? So, the genetic variations can vary widely in even different parts of the tumor. The same cancers in different people are radically different in their mutations, offering no patterns at all. And because there is no pattern in mutation, it's not possible to develop a targeted drug to affect genetic mutations. So, more targeted drugs uh, might give cancer patients a few more months. Some of these chemotherapy uh, drugs offer no survival benefit at all. It can cost more than $100,000 for a course of treatment. And when it comes to <clears throat> cancer drugs, there's no relationship between price and value. Okay? Uh, pharmaceutical companies have not always been honest regarding their claims that they make their drugs. In May 2016, Roche and OSI Pharmaceuticals were fined $67 million to settle claim that they misled doctors by inflating survival data. Okay, That's British Medical Journal, June of 2016. I'm going to be quoting British Medical Journal a lot in this talk. So this is something you can all look up. Is this, this is, these are free articles online in the British Medical Journal. And I covered this whole expose in my radio show back when I was doing it. But in October of 2017, the British Medical Journal stated over 50% of the cancer drugs approved between 2009 and 2013 were completely worthless. Yet they were still being used. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, now, now we're going to get to the heart of what I want to talk about tonight, okay? In the early 1900s, there's a German scientist and physician by the name of Otto Warburg. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, one person, two, three, three people? Okay, that's good. Otto Warburg was to biochemistry and physiology as to where Einstein was to physics, okay? He was that good. In fact, Einstein was a pers close personal friend of Otto Warburg's, as were a lot of very other famous Nobel Prize winning uh, scientists. One of the things he found is he, the, let's go back to, to where he, he was in Nazi Germany, the time when the Nazis took over, okay? He was a Jewish homosexual 
He was a brilliant scientist, absolutely brilliant. Now, what do you think the chances of a Jewish homosexual surviving Nazi Germany were? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Zero. Okay? Yeah, very little. But here's the thing. His reputation was so stellar as a scientist. And the Germans, the Nazis knew that he was working on a, on a, uh, a connection between diet and cancer. Now, you have to understand something about Hitler. Hitler's mother died of cancer, and, and Hitler was obsessed with finding a cure for cancer. And so they left him alone, okay? And that's all, if you want to read a, an account of that, this book, this is a great book. It's called Ravenous, Otto Warburg, the Nazis, and the Search for the Cancer Diet Connection. It is a great book. And so Otto Warburg was looking for that. He was looking for this cancer diet connection. What he found, he found something that he won the Nobel Prize for. He found that cancer ferments sugar for energy. Now that's a completely abnormal process in the body because our cells have a, 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 another process called glycolysis, which we make energy. So cancer cells are completely different than normal cells, and they ferment sugar, and so he won the, the Nobel Prize for that. Now, when the mutation and genetic theory came out, Warburg's stuff was kind of pushed to the side, okay? But there is a guy by the name of Pete Pedersen, who's a researcher at Johns Hopkins, and he continued Warburg's work in the energy material uh, theory of uh, Metabolism theory of cancer. Now, now here's an interesting little, little side note to this. Pete Pedersen was a student um, of a biochemist by the name of uh, Leninger, Albert Leninger. Okay. Now, when I was in college in the 70s, the biochemistry textbooks that most people use was a, a book called Leninger's Biochemistry. Okay, Albert Leninger was a friend of Otto Warburg. Okay, so that's the connection between Pedersen and Warburg. So Leninger, Albert Leninger, knew, knew the value of, of, of Otto Warburg's research and obviously uh, influenced Pete Pedersen. So... Uh, Pedersen discovered several important aspects of, of cancer metabolism. Now, he found that cancer cells have damaged mitochondria and far fewer of them than normal cells. Now, mitochondria are the power plants of the cells that produce energy, okay? That's a really, really crucial finding. He found that there's an abnormal enzyme driving the process called hexokinase 2. And this young Korean postdoctoral student named Young Hee Ko, who worked for Pedersen and worked in his lab, discovered that a common chemical that you can buy anywhere, 3 bromopyruvate, stopped cancer without damaging any of the surrounding tissue by, by gumming up this enzyme right here called hexokinase 2. Now, she started her own pharmaceutical company and... and, and so you can, you can go out and buy this, but I wouldn't advise, you know, if you have cancer, just start taking it, you know I mean? Because there's other, you know, there's ways that you have to deliver it into the body, and, and it, is, it isn't quite that simple. But she um, found, she, she, they did a couple of experiments on, on people that had cancer, and they were able to just stop the cancer immediately. And it doesn't hurt any of the tissue, because... It targets this enzyme right here, hexokinase 2. So, um, Cohen <coughs> basically discovered a cure for cancer. Now, the ability of, of 3 bromopyruvate to destroy most cancers has been verified by PET scans, but our efforts to bring this cure to market has been stymied by professional jealousy, the greed of other research, and other people who try to steal her research, but she's from what I understand, I looked this up online, and she's um, ready to do her first clinical trial with um, a 3-bromopyruvate. Now, 
many cancer researchers, such as Patterson, and another one, very famous one, by the name of Thomas Seyfried, wrote a big textbook on cancer, uh, have concentrated on studying the breakdowns in metabolism, which are common to all cancers. So Seyfried, you, he has a lot of lectures on YouTube that you can watch, and he's, he's really good. Here's what they found. The issue is dysfunctional mitochondria. That's the issue in cancer. You've got to fix that. That's one of the things we're going to talk about. So each cell contains thousands of these mitochondria, which produce energy, okay? And, and what, what organ in the body do you think has the most mitochondria? It uses the most energy. Anybody? Liver? Nope. Heart. 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 Heart has the most mitochondria. <clears throat> so, uh, there's a growing appreciation among cancer <coughs> scientists that mitochondria plays a critical role in, in turning a normal cell into a cancer cell. Now, mitochondria in cancer cells consume blood sugar 50 times faster than normal cells. So, here's the thing. The mitochondria ferment sugar to make energy. Okay, that's and, and, and that is the issue in cancer. And that's what Warburg discovered. That's, that's, that was his discovery. Now, signals from distressed mitochondria and the excess of nutrients, specifically sugar, in the cell can lead to an overload of, um, an, uh, of oxidants, reactive oxygen species, which alter the genetic expression. And the DNA of the mitochondria is unspooled, and it makes it more vulnerable to more mutations. What this means is this, is when you have too much sugar in the cell and it damages the mitochondria, the DNA of the cell actually changes, it unspools, and actually causes genetic mutations to occur. So the genetic mutations are a result of what's going on with the metabolism, not the opposite. Okay, so that's, that's really important to understand because if you can keep the mitochondria from screwing up the cell and becoming malignant, you, 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 you can solve the cancer issue, and that's what they're looking at. So there's an, inter, inter, an intimate relationship between sugar consumption, elevated insulin levels, mitochondrial dysfunction, and cancer. Okay, so... If you want to prevent cancer in your life, you've got to stay away from sugar. You've got to keep it at a minimal level, okay? So the following cancers are associated with elevated insulin. Breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreas, uterus, kidney, esophagus, and prostate. That's all in this book right here, all in there. Okay, so what drives insulin up? Sugar. Sugar. Sugar consumption, okay? So diet is extremely important in managing and healing from cancer. Cancer cells demand an enormous amount of sugar. If you eliminate all simple carbohydrates from your diet, you literally starve cancer cells because that's what they eat. Okay, this diet is known as a restrictive ketogenic diet. Um, it's high in fat, non-starchy carbs, and moderate in protein. Uh, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the ketogenic diet, but this diet, along with regular water-only fasts, is a powerful cancer strategy. So fasting, if you want to, if you want to know one word that that would be a great cancer strategy, is regular fasting because it starves the cancer cells of anything to eat, anything. Okay. So Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas Graber, a professor um, of molecular and medical pharmacology, who wrote in an article in the journal of Molecular Systems Biology, demonstrated that glucose starvation, depriving cancer cells of glucose, activates a metabolic and signaling amplification loop that leads to cancer cell death, okay? Um, now, this comes, this is a quote right out of this book. 
precisely how much sugar is too much may be different for each person, depending on one's gene, genes and age and exercise habits and capacity to store fat safely. But the path from refined sugar added to our diets to insulin resistance and from insulin resistance to cancer is now well understood and based on widely accepted science. So this is a, a Dr. Christine Horner from Medi Harvard Medical School. And what she found out, and I'll just explain this instead of reading it, was that if you take teenage girls and you feed them a lot of sugar, their chances of getting breast cancer later go way up. So if you want to save your daughters or granddaughters from cancer, don't feed them sugar. And what do they get? Well, I mean, what do most teenagers eat? Sugar. sugar. Yeah, they eat a lot of it, okay? You know, and I ate some when I was a teenager. I don't think I ate as much as they do now, but I definitely ate some. So, um, what are some other things that damage mitochondria besides sugar? There's other things. Medications. So, all these medications. Pain and anti-inflammatory medications. And, and if you want to read more about that, there's another great book called The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. Uh, like aspirin and Tylenol, how many people take that? Lots of people. Angina medications. Here's the big one, cholesterol medication. Cholesterol med statins are like, like poison to mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Okay, antidepressants, some antibiotics, not all of them. Now here's the, the, the paradox. Chemotherapy meds <laughs> damage mitochondria. Yeah. So the very thing they're giving to treat cancer causes the thing that causes cancer. Anxiety medications. Okay, number two, nearly all industrial chemicals, including plasticizers. Now, we're never going to get away from plastics. Listen, I'm not saying, but there's some things you just don't do. Like, don't microwave in plastic. Okay, don't do that. You know, uh, uh, you know, try and, and decrease the amount of plastic. Like, don't, you can avoid storing food in plastic. That's good, okay? But pesticides and insecticides, toxic metal exposure, solvents, all of those things damage mitochondria. And what's all this? Is, all of this is from an industrialized society. Now, how do we heal mitochondrial function if it's bad? Okay, and I'll, I'll show you a test later that can, can show you um, what's going on with mitochondria. So fasting, intermittent fasting, and eating fewer calories. Okay, uh, you know, I'm a huge believer in intermittent and regular fasting. You know, I do it regularly. It's part of my lifestyle. Uh, I'm not saying I don't like to eat because I do, you know, who doesn't, you know, but I do regular fasting, intermittent fasting. Get rid of refined carbohydrates like soda, white bread, and pastries. Just don't eat them. Or just, you know, once a year. You know, don't eat them. Uh, eat quality protein like grass-fed beef and pasture-raised eggs. And eat food sources of omega-3s and alpha-lipoic acid. Now, food sources of alpha-lipoic acid are Brussels sprouts, carrots, or beets. Okay? Very high in, the, in that. So I know all of you were probably really excited about eating more Brussels sprouts. <laughs> yeah. I like them. You know. uh, so uh, another thing, eat antioxidant-rich foods like dark chocolate minus huge amounts of sugar, okay? Vitamin CH is what I call it. Uh, get exercise regularly. And uh, infrared saunas are good, reduce stress, and get seven to eight hours of sleep at night. This is all things that you can do to help heal mitochondria. So what about these people that burn the candle on both ends, eat lots of sugar and drink these energy drinks to stay awake? What do you think they're doing to their bodies? They're killing themselves, okay? You know, it, 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 that just doesn't work, okay? Um, so, mitochondria require the following nutrients. Magnesium, L-carnitine, D-ribose, uh, uh, B vitamins, uh, that's 
in my Cataplex B core, alpha lipoic acid, CoQ10, omega-3 fatty acids, a lot of which, all of which, if, you're, if you work at it, you can get from your diet, or, or most of it. Okay, but here's another thing. This is really interesting. This is a, a, a journal article that came out in January of 2021. This is almost two years ago. And it said, it's in, the, it's in a journal called Future Medicinal Chemistry. And let's look at the, look at the, uh, uh, the, the name of the article. It says, Melatonin Synthesis in and Uptake by Mitochondria. Implications for disease cells with dysfunctional mitochondria. So let's see what this article says. There are key points from this article. I didn't know this until I read this article. Your, my, your, your mitochondria produce melatonin. All of your mitochondria produce melatonin. I didn't know that. Melatonin is a very powerful antioxidant which protects the mitochondria from damage. Loss of the ability to produce melatonin will lead to cellular disease. When cells exhibit the Warburg effect, meaning they, they ferment sugar, melatonin production is shut down. A loss of melatonin at the mitochondrial level also accompanies aging. So what happens is when you lose, when the mitochondria lose the ability to produce melatonin, they break down, and that's when they get on the pathway to cancer. It has been suggested that taking melatonin at night might be a good strategy for seniors. Well, I, I, I don't know about that. Here's the thing. Melatonin is a hormone. So if you're healthy and you have the ability to sleep, I don't like to give hormones to people because... You give a hormone to somebody, it throws all the other hormones out of balance. So I like to give the things that the body can use to make hormones. However, when you have severe mitochondrial dysregulation, then you need to take melatonin. Okay, so cancer, inflammation, fibrosis, Alzheimer's, all of these things. Now... Here's an interesting fact, too. Exogenously administered, meaning taking it orally, melatonin inhibits cell proliferation of most cancer cells. That's out of another article from Cellular and Molecular Life Sciences, February 20th of this year. So what they're saying is that if you take melatonin and you've got dysfunctional mitochondria with cancer, that will inhibit the growth of the cancer cells. How, how many, anybody ever heard of that? No. Yeah, why not? Yeah. You know, why isn't this kind of stuff on TV? No money. Why is it on the news? I, I, I can tell you why. It's because the medical profession is so invested in pharmaceuticals, they cannot think of another model. That's the reason, okay? So, it also works well for treating COVID. Melatonin works well for treating COVID. Now, look at this. Look at this quote. Now, this is a quote from a book called Unlocking the Keto Code. Anybody in here ever hear of Stephen Gundry? Yeah. Okay, a very famous cardiologist. But in this book, it says, here's, here's this quote, melatonin has the power to prevent and reverse cancer, cancer through uncoupling mechanisms, enhancing mitochondrial function in the process. That's a pretty bold statement because this guy's really famous. I mean, he's a very famous heart surgeon. Anybody know why he quit heart surgery? He just quit doing it. He got sick of treating symptoms. Mm -hmm. You see, he got, he got tired of treating people coming in and just treating their symptoms and then seeing them again five, ten years later. He does functional medicine now. All his books are about functional medicine. Okay? Now look what he says. I'm now prescribing what many would consider ultra-high doses of melatonin, up to 100 milligrams a day in divided doses. And a pretty high dosage normally would be like 3 milligrams. Mm -hmm. He's doing 100. To some of my patients diagnosed with dementia or cancer to help them get rid of their mitochondrial function back online. 
This includes 44 milligrams daily to his beloved Labradoodle, diagnosed with bladder cancer. She, he said two weeks after starting her, her <laughs> supplement, she started peeing like a racehorse. She <laughs> hasn't had a problem since. Okay? I assume he's talking about the Labradoodle and not his wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what does the medical literature say about diet and cancer? Cancer patients usually have significant malnutrition, and many patients have nutrition, nutrition deficits before diagnosis. Now, here's a question I would ask. Do you think it's possible that the nutrition deficit apps really contributed to the underlying cancer? I think it could. You know, uh, Many cancer patients develop a tumor-associated malnutrition characterized by an insufficient supply of macro and micronutrients. So what would be a micronutrient? Anybody? Calcium. Calcium, yeah. Your minerals, vitamins, minerals, you know, phytonutrients. What would be a macronutrient? Protein. Yeah, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Okay. So, uh, eating habits or individual nutrition factors modify the risk for developing cancer. Now, this article says, I'll show you the, what the journalist came out of it in a minute. Supportive nutrition therapy should be an integral part of cancer care. I want to say this, if, if you have an oncologist, or you know of an oncologist, and I've heard this, I've actually heard them tell their patients this, or their patients told me, listen, you can eat anything you want. We're going to do this chemotherapy, but just go eat, enjoy your life, eat anything you want. You need to run from that kind of, you need to run from that, because that doesn't jive with science. That's not congruent with science. It says micronutrients includes vitamins and mineral supplements, okay. Malnutrition arises when anti-neoplastic procedures are initiated, meaning chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, radiation and chemotherapy affect the patient's food selection, nutrient absorbing, and nutrient utilization. This is in, in a journal called Oncology Reports, October 2010. You got that reference. Um, in, in your notes. So British Medical Journal, 2018. I like British Medical Journal because they seem to be a little bit more honest about things than, than some of the American journals do. There's a risk of cancer, especially breast cancer, is associated with the risk of ultra-processed foods. A 10% Increase in the proportion of ultra-processed foods in the diet translates to a 12% increase in overall risk of cancer and 11% increase in breast cancer. So, according to the British Medical Journal, what are ultra-processed foods? Sugary products, sugary drinks, start breakfast cereal, okay? Ultra-processed fruits and vegetables uh, would be a, like an ultra-processed vegetable. Well, Canned peas? What? Canned peas? Um, <clears throat> that's processed. I wouldn't call it ultra-processed. How about a potato chip? Oh, yeah. Okay. That would be ultra-processed. Okay. Or a, a, uh, a Dorito. Okay. <clears throat> uh, dairy products. Instant noodles or soups, uh, reconstituted meatballs, poultry, and fish nuggets. Okay, chicken nuggets, chicken McNuggets. Okay, frozen or shelf-stable ready meals, food products made mostly of sugar, oil, and fat. Sounds a lot like donuts, you know. Add a little flour in that. Uh, so here's some ultra-processed food. You know, lean cuisine. Uh, you know, Eggo, Eggo waffles, uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, now, here's another interesting fact that you should know about cancer. That mushrooms have anti-cancer and anti-tumor properties. This is a mushroom product that I carry here called Glycan Renew. But there's some really good research. Um, 
uh, most recent research has demonstrated the anti-cancer properties of mushrooms. Um, you know what the the pro the property is? They're polysaccharides or uh, glycans, which exhibit potential immunomodulatory or anti-cancer properties. So uh, there's a lot of good research on mushrooms and cancer. Okay, the chief medicinal uses of mushrooms discovered so far are antioxidant, anti-diabetic, hypocholesteremic, anti-tumor, anti-cancer, immunomodulatory, uh, modulatory, anti-allergic, a nephroprotective, meaning protecting kidneys, and antimicrobial agents. Now, here's some things that I, just a strategy that I suggested for the management of cancer. Uh, these are some things that you can do to uh, increase your immunity. Uh, now, what if you wanted to do some laboratory tests that you want to just look at? You know, what are what's going on in my body? You know, what are you, what are, what are my cells doing? Some really good tests out there. Um, the first three are just things that I do automatically on my comprehensive blood panel. But you show me somebody's fasting insulin, and I'll tell you where they're headed. Okay. If somebody comes in with a fasting insulin, you know, 30, 35, that's kind of high. You know, they're not heading down a good path. Okay, so these three things can tell you about uh, uh, where they're headed and what's, what, what um, is being damaged in the cell. Hair mineral analysis uh, will show ex past exposure to toxic metals and what's being stored in the body. There's a test called the GLP Great Plains Lab Tox Test. They look at exposure to a wide variety of different industrial chemicals and how much of that you're carrying in your system. And last but certainly not least would be organic acid testing, which literally tests mitochondrial function. They have a section on that test that shows, there's about five tests that show how well your mitochondria are working. And if they're not working, what you can do about it. So that's pretty valuable. Plus it shows a whole lot of other things in the body. They're really valuable, like um, toxicity indicators, detoxification efficiency, um, a lot of things that say what's going on with this person's metabolism and what needs to be changed. So those are some tests that, that I do in the office uh, some of the many tests that I do, but those are really good for at least getting a handle on, you know, why your body may be dysfunctional. Uh, so that's what I have tonight. And I'm going to ask you, who do you know that doesn't know about what we've talked about tonight? Who do you know? Who comes to mind? You know, maybe you ought to send them a text and say, hey, I was thinking about you. I saw this talk. I'm thinking about you because, you know, you stop drinking all that pop, you're going to kill yourself. You know, so who do you know? And maybe they need to be, you know, maybe you can show them your notes. Because those are the people that need to know how to help themselves and how to, how to protect their bodies from disease. And there's, you know, I showed you some ways tonight. There's some ways that you can test for it. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, just with what you know from tonight, there's lots of strategies that you can do to uh, help yourself get healthy. And that's my goal, is to bring health, hope, and healing to Lincoln. So, any questions anybody has? Yes. Do you have a melatonin supplement you offer her? Not right. We, we can get it. You know, I haven't gotten it yet, because I, I, but we can certainly get it, yes. Have a good one. Yeah. What about alkalization for cancer? I heard the cancer can't survive in alkalized bodies. Well, what happens, and that's a great question. That's why we, we drink alkaline water. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that cancer itself causes the alkaline body to be acid. Okay. So the thought was, is does, does an acid body create cancer? And that's what we've always thought. Well, I think it was this book here. <clears throat> that said um, it's really cancer 
that causes the body to become acidic. Mm. And by the way, if you want to just read a great book just on the history of chemotherapy and, all, and cancer and all that, Tripping Over the Truth, I had a whole slew of extra slides tonight. I just I tried to par this thing down because mm. otherwise it had been just way too much. Mm. But this book is really good. Travis Christofferson. It's a classic. Uh, so, any other questions? Yes, Randy. So that melatonin, going back to that, if you're not a senior, would you still advise to take a melatonin every night then? You, you could. The, the thing is, is that um, it, it depends on how, like, I don't take melatonin. Okay, I'm 69. You know, I'm a senior. I, I don't take it because I don't think that my, I think my mitochondria are working pretty well and I don't want to screw up my hormones. Okay, now, if I came down with COVID or I, came, or I had cancer or something, I'd take a ton of it, okay? I'd be taking, you know, probably 100 milligrams three in divided doses during the day, like, like uh, uh, Dr. Gundry's giving his patients. But that's a different situation. I don't take it because melatonin is a hormone, and I just don't want to throw all my hormones out of balance. You know, if, if you got cancer, everything's out of balance. So, you know, then, then it would be fine to take it. I mean, but a lot of people do, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, you know, don't take any melatonin, but I'm just telling you why I don't take it. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Jeff. Where can you get the 3-bromopyruvate? 3-bromopyruvate? Any lab, any, any chemical supply. Is it something you need a prescription for or no? You can buy it off the shelf. Okay. The thing is, is that the way they're delivering it yeah. is they're actually delivering it venously right into the tumor. Oh, wow. They're not taking it orally like a capsule. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't work like mm -hmm. that. So they're delivering it in a very specific way in very specific doses. And so it probably wouldn't work on a blood cancer. Probably not. But I wouldn't. I would think about like doing some uh, uh, melatonin mm -hmm. and some mushrooms and things like that for that. Right. For sure. Okay. But the three bromopyruvate. Uh, you know this this young Hiko discovered it. She and some other people figured out how to administer it, what dosages, and that's their proprietary secret. Right. But you can buy it. I could make it. And when I was in, in, in college in chemistry, I could have made it in the lab. You know, it's been a while since I've been in the lab, so I couldn't do it now. But, but it's easy to make. It's not hard. And you can buy it. You can go to a chemical supply store and buy it. There's commercial chemical yeah, supply Yeah, commercial store. chemical supply store and buy it. Hmm. But what are you, how are you going to use it? <laughs> you know, that's a problem, you know. So so uh, uh, that's what Young He Co. figured out is she and some German physicians figured out how to administer it so it actually kills cancer. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it would work on blood cancer or not. I just, you know, I don't treat cancer. You know, I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> but uh, but I, I treat people with cancer and... I think that it's in with my within my license to help people with uh, nu the nutritional aspects of this to help them eat right and do things right so that that their bodies can heal. What's the red light therapy? The is it infrared therapy? Red light therapy, laser. Is that laser. something you can purchase for your own home and do it on your own, or you have to come in for it? Like or? the laser I have. Oh, I guess I didn't realize what it was. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's, yeah, it's laser, okay. laser therapy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. So your valerian that you have here, would you add valerian and maybe a menatonin together for better sleep? You can try it. Yeah, you can try that. You're not sleeping. You know, definitely. You know, and if you, you know, if you want to find out how your mitochondria function, I would do the organic, organic acid test. They'll tell you. They'll tell you right away how your mitochondria are doing. What is it again? Organic acid test. It's, it's actually in there on the last page. 
Uh, anybody else? Yes. Do you have any suggestions for the intermittent fasting procedure? I mean, I, do you oh, I do. I have a lot of suggestions okay. on that. I tell you what I do. Okay. So a lot of days I don't eat till maybe one or one thirty. Okay. And that's my first meal of the day. I have coffee in the morning, you know, and, I, I, and I'm wondering whether that's the best thing for me, you know, but I have coffee in the morning. I don't eat till 1 or 1 30, except on Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I start here at 1, and I usually eat about 11 or 11 30. It's my first meal. On the weekends, it's usually noon, 1, 1 30. You know, and then I have that window between one and six and one and seven as to where I eat. That's how I do it. And then on on Thursdays I eat Thursday noon. It's the only meal I eat that day. I don't eat again till Friday night. So I know it seems like a lot, but you, your body can get used to anything. Yeah. It can get used to fasting. You know, it's not hard. Once your body's used to it, it's just like anything else. So what would you say is the main, the main goal of doing that? Uh, my main goal is burning the fat and, and um, uh, using fat for fuel instead of sugar and healing my mitochondria. It's my main goal when I do that. But I, like, for example... <clears throat> Uh, on a typical day, I'll, I'll do heavy exercise in the morning, early in the morning, like seven ish, and I won't eat anything till, you know, noon to one thirty. But you're drinking water. Drinking water. Yeah. What? No juice. No, but water. <laughs> Definitely water. Add coffee in the morning. Bone broth. Uh, no bone. I mean, you can have bone broth. I don't. You know. But I, I don't eat I, I don't eat anything or drink anything like that until I eat at one or one thirty. How do you deal with the toxins that are released as you're burning the fat? I I don't know. I just yeah. they just gotta do some go somewhere, you know. I mean <laughs> Yeah. I you know, I I exercise, I sweat, you know, I I, I mean I can't say I do everything perfectly. I don't have a sauna at home, you know, and, and but uh, I intermittently fast. I do that pretty well. So I, I mean, I figure my body's got to figure out what to do with them, get rid of them, you know. And I eat, I eat a lot of, a lot of vegetables, a lot of salads, a lot of cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower. I eat a lot of that stuff. So um, that's pulling things out constantly. I take uh, one of the standard process products. I take this cruciferous complete, which is you know you know a very uh, uh, concentrated form of cruciferous powder. So I take that once a day. Uh, I take a lot of my own products, a lot. Cataplex B core, which is really good for mitochondria. You know I eat a lot of carrots has alpha lipoic acid. So, uh, you know, I try and, and uh, you know, my diet is pretty good. It's not perfect. You know, I don't eat perfectly, you know. Uh, and most of the people that have absolute perfect diets, I don't even like being around. <laughs> so, so, you know, my diet's not perfect, okay? It's, it's darn good, but it's not perfect. Okay. So, yeah, Terry. What do you consider a good A1C? A good A1C? Yeah. Uh, less than 5.6. <sighs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, the highest it should be 5.5. Okay. Well, and mine got above 5.6 a while ago, like six months ago. And so I'm, I don't know how it got there, but I'm getting it back down again. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it got a little, it got a little bit above that. I don't like that. So, but my insulin level is really low, so that part is good. So, uh, so, so it's not too. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. is there anything you suggest for like, chelation of toxic metals and stuff? Uh, yes. Uh, we have uh, 
One of the things that helps get rid of toxic metals is getting the right other minerals in that sort of kick the bad guys out of the neighborhood. And then like doing something, we have a product called um, GI Absorb, which helps pull toxic metals out of the body. That's a good product for that. I took that for a while. But see, if you're low, it's like if you've got, the way I look, the way I look at it is like this. If you're low in basic minerals, like zinc, chromium, selenium, magnesium, manganese, calcium, if you're low in those minerals, your body will try and substitute something else for that. So they'll tend to absorb toxic metals like aluminum, mercury, cadmium, lead. And so one of the ways you kick the bad guys out of the neighborhood is you bring in the good guys and that your body tends to get rid of the bad guys. And then that's so uh, like a, a hair metals test will show that or a blood metals test will show that. Okay, blood metals test shows current exposure. Hair metal test shows like past exposure. So you can, you know, doing those tests, you can tell what you need and what you need to get rid of. Uh, and then I use like GI Absorb helps get rid of, you know, heavy metals, things like that. Isn't that what your fasting <clears throat> is doing a lot of times too? It's helping get rid of things, yeah. Yeah, because your body, when you fast, then your body can use that energy that it, it uses to metabolize food to heal, to get rid of things that it doesn't need. So uh, that's part of what fasting is all about for me too. Although you really need to go on a longer fast for that to really happen really well. But um, yeah. Well, in, in your talk tonight, you mentioned that Cancer can be caused by nutrition. How do you get nutrition during a fast? Isn't that keeping nutrients out of the body as opposed to taking, I mean, besides supplements? So cancer lives off sugar. Okay. 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 So when you fast, you're not taking anything in. Okay. So you're not feeding it anything that it can use. Okay. To maintain itself. Okay. Okay. So fasting is the best way. Okay. You know, and I've heard that, that um, fasting combined with chemotherapy makes the chemotherapy way more effective. Interesting. But I, I'm gonna tell you, I'll just right. say this right now, I'm not telling anybody else to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, if I got cancer, mm -hmm. I'd not have chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I would not do it, wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. okay? I'll die rather than, now I'm not saying any of <laughs> you should do it, or I'm not, you know, I'm not condemning anybody who's had it, I'm just telling you what I would do. Okay. It's going to hurt more than help. Yeah. Well, I, I've seen it hurt people, and it's pretty darn expensive. And I just wouldn't do it. You know, I'm just telling you. And I'd figure out another way, you know, but I'm not doing that. Anybody else? Okay, good. Thank you very much. And anybody that was watching online, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, in two weeks, we're going to do natural health care for animals. So I'm going to talk about how animals can benefit from natural health care and chiropractic. And we're going to, I'm going to demonstrate on how to, how I adjust animals. So you want to come, it's kind of fun, kind of a fun talk. And if you like dogs, you know, you'll get to see me adjust a dog. And, uh, so, yeah, that's in two weeks, okay? So if you have an animal that you want adjusted, bring it in, and we'll, I'll adjust it for you, okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you might be able to save it from its back legs not working someday, which is why most people bring their pets to me. Have you ever so done back cats? Legs, not, what? Yeah. I've done cats. He's done oh, cats, yeah. too. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So um, if you got an animal that you want to adjust, it, come to the oh, talk, wow. bring it in, and I'll be happy to work on it. It's a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Except if you're bringing dogs and cats, we want to keep them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, are, we don't need a big cat fight. <laughs> <we are>. yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.